We are now beginning the afternoon session of the Archibald Gardner reunion. You are looking at beautiful Swift Creek Canyon in the background where Archibald Gardner built his mills. We begin the program with Deanne Gardner Vandeford playing and singing Family Reunion. Family. one of the best ways to depict the life of Archibald Gardner in summary, and it's very difficult to do in summary because he accomplished so much, was to do it by way of re Reader's Theater. Virginia Black has prepared a Reader's Theater. She's a descendant of Sarah Jane Hamilton, who only had one child, James Hamilton, who was very prominent, and we have a lot of their descendants here today. So if the Reader's Theater will come forward, it's the best way to summarize that life. Archibald Gardner, pioneer extraordinaire. Archibald, a giant among men. All of us here today can feel with great pride of his life and accomplishments. How many of you have ever heard or know anything about Archibald Gardner? Well, dear cousins, your hearts will leap forward as you listen to this story about his struggles, joys, dreams, and most of all, his strengths. Archibald stood five foot ten inches tall, broad a shoulder, and in his prime weighed between 200 and 220 pounds. The largest stature, he was very agile. And like Longfellow's village blacksmith, the muscles of his brawny arms were strong as arm bands, as iron bands. He lived life to the fullest. He realized that heaven in all its glory only shines upon those who work for it, and he loved living in the light. As a man of vision, he literally saved lives because of this gift. He once ran into an old friend of his, and his friend said, 
Why is it, Archie, that you and I came to this country at the same time? I am a wealthy man now, and you are still very poor. Archie smiled and asked his friend, How many wives do you have? <laughs> the friend answered, One. And how many children, asked Archie. One, replied the friend. You see, said Archie, I am the wealthy man. I have 11 wives and 48 children. These I will take with me through eternity. And you, my dear friend, can't take your money with you. That was Archie's outlook on life always working and looking to the future, and for those people he could help. He constructed several homes in his life, a log cabin and a large house in Canada, a home in Mill Creek where the Four Seasons restaurant is now stand, one in Spanish Fork, West Jordan, and Star Valley. Archie was a true pioneer, a man of strength and will, of power, of intellect, and health. Kilsit, Scotland, on September 2nd, 1814. Maybe the strength of our Archibald lies partly with the land in which he was born. They were a race of strong men, large of stature, of athletic build, and great physical endurance. Oh, Caledonia, stern and wild, meet nurse for a poetic child. Land of brown heath and shaggy wood, land of the mountain and the flood, Land of my sires, what mortal hand can e'er untie the filial band that knits me to thy rugged strand? In 1822, because of severe political unrest in Scotland, the Gardner family immigrated to Canada. Archibald was nine years of age at the time. So his parents, Robert and Margaret, his two sisters, Mary and Janet, and his two brothers, William and Robert, for a time found peace in Canada. In 1843, Archibald Gardner and his family converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Three years later, because of heavy religious prosecution, he sold his two grist mills and at a considerable loss and traveled to Nauvoo in the early spring. Because his enemies were desperately seeking to keep him at his home in Canada, he decided to leave his wife and family and go alone, and they planned to come later. 
When he arrived at the partially frozen St. Clair River, he was unable to cross because the ice was beginning to break up, thundering and trembling into pieces. He retired a short distance away and prayed that the Lord would stop the flow of ice so that he could not fail, so he could not fall into the hands of his enemies. His earnest and humble prayer was answered. For as soon as he stepped to the edge of the unbroken ice, it stopped breaking, and he jumped from ice flow to ice flow to the other side. The crowd that had gathered looked on in amazement. One person said, What does this mean? Who ever saw the ice stop like this before? After he crossed the river, he continued his journey. Since it was spring, the roads were muddy and walking was difficult. After 60 miles of walking, he became, became tired. He knelt in prayer again, and after thanking the Lord for helping him across the ice, he said, If it is not asking too much, please send a team this way that I may ride. I am still within reach of my enemies, for people saw me cross the river. And there are those in the crowd who knew me. Shortly thereafter, the next wagon coming by stopped, and the driver asked Archie if he wanted to ride. He drove in to within 20 miles of Detroit, and he walked the rest of the way into the city. Then he was able to proceed by railroad through to a point not far from Nauvoo. Most of the saints had left the city on their journey westward. After spending a few days in the deserted city, he traveled to St. Louis, where he met his wife and family. Oh, what a happy meeting it was. The Lord had spared his family and relatives, and all rejoiced in the faith and spirit of the gospel. They followed the rest of the saints to the west and spent their first winter at winter quarters. Then they left to go to the Salt Lake Valley in June of 1847. Just like the rest of the saints crossing the plains, they suffered, suffered their share of sorrow and, and uh, problems. The Gardner clan arrived in Salt Lake Valley October 1st, 1847, and Archie said, Oh, what a desolate valley that is to be our future home. There are so many exciting and disturbing adventures of this way of Archie. We wish we could relate them all to you. But we do want you to know this outstanding pioneer. So we will touch you on a few of the highlights and experiences of this outstanding pioneer. He has many things, he, has, he was many things in his lifetime. Mailmaker, athletic competitor, storyteller, minor canal builder, organizer, legislator, husband and father. Organizer. Pioneer extraordinaire. Religious man. Polygamist. Millmaker. Archibald told his granddaughter Delilah that the sweetest music to his ears has always come from the sound of falling waters on the wheel of a busy meal. I loved it as a child in Scotland. I love it now. Mill making was a family affair. At the beginning, he was in a partnership with his brother Robert, and then with his sons. They would live and work at the mills. Archie was famous all over the territory for his mills and how efficiently he ran them. They were a work of art, created lovingly by their builder, Archibald Gardner. He sawed the first commercial lumber on the first formal grant of water for industrial purposes in Utah. He built the second flour mill in Utah. He built sawmills, grist mills, woolen mills, shingle mills, dug the first canal mill race on the Jordan River, and many steam mills. This was his life's work. He was a builder. He built 35 mills and maybe more. Archie lived his life to 
Contests of brawn and brain. The Gardner brothers excelled in feats of strength and skill. They could not resist a challenge to vanquished friends and foe. Archie held the record in Canada for long distance foot racing. He could walk 50 miles a day for days at a time. He even won a 10 mile race with a doctor riding a horse drawn cutter. He could outrun his sons, much to their chagrin. The brothers were famous for their stick pulling. <laughs> suggested, but he had a yarn to fit it. Never did he enter a crowd, but he was the center of attention. Everyone gathered around him to enjoy his good humor and to listen to his anecdotes. He radiated happiness and goodwill. He had a magnetic personality. At one time he was asked if he ever ran out of yarn. He replied that he was once in a contest with a famous teller of tales. The contest began one long winter night First one told the story, then the other tried to better it. Hour after hour passed along. About two or three in the morning, the audience began to thin out at daylight, but one or two remained. I'm through, the moment groaning and tired. I have just begun, spoke up Archibald, and ready for more. Of course, the longer the story the thicker the Swedish brogue became. Archie never tired. <laughs> Miner and canal builder. In the summer of 1863, a man working for Archibald found some ore that tested out to be rich in gold and silver. This was called complex ore because of it not being straight gold or straight silver. Even though this looked like a stroke of luck for Archie, it turned out that there was no way of refining this ore. For the page. They tried shipping it out to be refined, but the freight rates were so high that it was not profitable. Others had discovered this rich ore also. So they organized it into the Jordan Silver Mining District and drew up mining laws. This was all done at Archie's mill on the Jordan, and to no one's surprise, Archie was elected the first recorder. No one really became wealthy at that time, 
but eventually Eastern and English money moved in and made it profitable. There had to be a smelter in the valley, but up until that time, it was an up and down business. Archie said his main work was building and building irrigating canals. This he did in a big way. He had foresight and interest in any project for the good of his fellows. In 1887, Archibald and a group of other men formed what was known as the Hydraulic Canal Company with Archie as president. This company did work on dams and canals. He also put part of his outfits to digging the canals for the Utah and Salt Lake Canal Company and the Jordan Canal Company. These were called the upper and lower canals or the big and little canals. His most ambitious endeavor was to bring water from the Jordan River to the water, the bench land of the river, but was abandoned because of the lack of funds. Archie took a big loss on this canal. Other, another big project he undertook was the Galena Canal, taken out of the Jordan River East and little north of Bluffdale. The cost of digging that ditch was $35,000. At this point, we have to say something about Archie's bridge building. He loved doing that type of, con type of construction work also. Some of the bridges he built were over Big Cottonwood Creek, Provo River, Jordan River, and also one at Spanish Fork. We must mention also that many plans and surveys he could not implement at that time were done later by other companies or the government and proved very successful. Archibald the Organizer. Archibald organized everything and everybody. He had his finger in every pie in the territory. He was the president of this and the president of that, and it seems that he was the organizer's organizer. <laughs> Archibald, Archibald, Archibald Gardner was known far and wide for his strength of character that was bona fide. His opinion, opinion was sought by large and small. Even Brigham Young asked his wherewithal. As his de de descendants, we tend to lionize, but oh, how he could organize. Now, this is from Elkwood, but a temporary McClellan is going to see. We should get it now for buying homes to put on the land where the buffalo roams. And Archie said, not to our surprise, let's do it, folks. First, we organize. A meeting was called for each Mill Creek resident. At that gathering, they made Archie president. He fixed prices for farm goods that were very fair. He wanted each farmer to get his square share. Now, Archie, is there something else you advise? Yes, dear people, we must organize. Most important territory convention showed Utah wanted to join the nation. A constitution they must frame, a state government of great acclaim. Archie was chosen to supervise, but first he had to organize. From canals to culture was his expertise, and six years managing a co-op store with ease. Though making mills was his first love, he'd tackle anything below or above. He's touched your lives, this you can't minimize. Remember, you too can organize. Legislator. Archibald served two years in the territorial, territorial legislature in 1878 and again in 1880. Perhaps he's the only man in Utah history that has himself, two sons, many grandsons, and a great-granddaughter served in the state legislature. Hamilton Gardner, president of the Senate when he served in the legislature. If there was anything Archie loved more than mill making, or mining, or canal building, then it was involvement in civic affairs. He was the moving force behind the fixing of uniform prices on produce and mechanical labor. He was the major in the Nauvoo Legion, Utah militia, and was in command of West Jordan, which comprised practically all of Salt Lake County. He was appointed to a committee to manage a large cattle drive. He was president of the first co-op store in Jordan and managed it for six years. 
On January 6th of 1862, a mass meeting was held and nine delegates were elected to attend a territorial convention which was to frame a constitution, organize a provisional state government, and ask for admission to the Union. Of course, Archibald was a delegate. He was president of the Hydraulic Canal Company and the first recorder of the Jordan Silver Mining District. Archibald Gardner as husband and father. Apostle John Henry Smith said of Archibald Gardner, God never placed a true man on this earth. He would spit the wind on that rusty and goose road. He was a giant among men. He never betrayed his wives, his children, or his God. Archibald Gardner was a man of great faith. He was a man of great faith. The night before, before he died, he rejoiced that every one of his numerous family had membership and standing in the church. Archie said of his family, There may be some who are better looking than my children, but I am proud of my family because I believe they are all honest. I think this group is wonderfully attractive, and I'll bet you are just as honest. He had 11 wives and 48 children, 27 sons and 21 daughters. Pioneer extraordinaire. Archie was a builder. He did a little of everything. Even though he had as many trials and tribulations as anyone else, he had a happiness in him that brought him and all of his family through him, and all the better for it. His vision and foresight was miraculous for he used them to better everyone's life. He was a manly man with the spirit of manly cheer. He had the strength to do and the will to dare and the courage to find his place. We talked about the homes he built and the places he went. Archibald had a settlement named after him, but in 1877, Gardnerville was consolidated with and made a part of the South Jordan Ward. And then in 1879, the name was changed to Riverton. Grasshoppers had presented a problem that vexed the people ever since they first came to the valley. Crickets and grasshoppers made such inroads into the crops that farmers became very discouraged at times. Many different schemes were devised for their extermination, but this plan appeared in the Deseret News, May 21st, 1870. Bishop A. Gardner of West Jordan called this morning and gave us his plan for killing grasshoppers. It consists of driving a flock of sheep hurriedly over the field, driving them in a compact herd. If driven early in the morning, on a cool day when the pests are sluggish and inclined to lie still, one or at most two drivings over will completely clear the field of live grasshoppers. <laughs> Archibald was a pioneer in the truest sense. He knew it was first necessary to provide food and shelter, and then roads and bridges, places for meeting, and forts for protection. With high courage, he entered a desert land, and with, notwithstanding poverty, isolation, and devastating pests, he and others hewed out a civilization which is the light to the world today. He was a generous and giving man in all the days of his life and told his sons, I am not interested in trying to get ahead. I don't live for myself alone. I have not accumulated treasures on earth, but I have tried to lay some up in heaven. I want something to my credit when I get there. As long as I have my flower or anything else, I will share it with those in need. In his 76th year, he fell in love again with Star Valley, Wyoming. So in 1889, he again went to help pioneer a new country. He immediately started to build the flour and sawmills, which were sorely needed by the people.
You're going to lead the saints over in Jordan, and I want you to be the father of his people. Uh, they are a sturdy pioneer, but they have their faults. Now, if they're a little too tall, I don't want you to cut their head off just to make them shorter. And if they're a little too short, I don't want you to pull their neck and pull it out of joint to make them a little taller. Brigham Young meant, of course, that Archie must take men as he finds them and be patient with their imperfections, which is good advice for all of us. Archibald served as bishop for 34 years. The historical country that he presided over extended from the point of the mountain on the south to the point of the mountain on the north. All the country west of the Jordan River to the Okra Mountains and also on the east side where Jordan River, Crescent, and Sandy Wards are now located. And the original name was West Jordan. Archie directed the building on the new West Jordan uh, workhouse after six years of labor and struggle, the beautiful stone building was dedicated in 1867. This dedication gave the saints an opportunity to have a big celebration with all the trimmings. One of the mottos printed on the banner read, Brigham leads, the kingdom grows. The stone is rolling, mind your toes. <laughs> This blended stone edifice is now used by the daughters of the Utah Pioneers. Our dear Viola Gardner was captain of the West Jordan DUP when the building was renovated for this purpose. Work had ceased on the temple substructure because cracks had been discovered and other defects noted. After serious consideration by President Young and his advisors, it was decided that the foundation would not sustain the tremendous weight to be placed upon it. What should be done? Could the defects of the temple substructure be rectified? Boy, this is serious. Oh, man. I don't know. All of you workmen are dismissed now. I'm going to sit down on this temple foundation till I work out this problem. Archie, could you sit down by me and maybe I'll tell you my problems? Sure. What do you think I should do about the foundation of the temple? Well, President Young, the trouble has arisen from the use of too much mortar. It will be necessary for you to tear out the entire foundation oh, and no. start over again. However, this time, have the workmen cut each stone to fit precisely against the next stone, and then lay them up without, any, without the use of any mortar. This will prevent any further settling or cracking or spreading, and your problem will be solved. Thanks, they're not going to like that. Polygamist. We must say something about how the part polygamy played in Archibald's life. In 1882, the Edmunds-Tucker Law was passed and persecution against the polygamist was on. Spies were everywhere trying to secure evidence against them. Deputy marshals were making raids all over. Houses were searched. Wives brought up before the grand jury and the saints were in trouble. Archibald had to run to go underground to protect himself. He couldn't stay in the valley and do business as usual. Listen to Archibald's word. I dreaded going to prison, so I went to Mexico. <laughs> but I was glad to come back. My business was all going to wreck, and I felt it duty-bound to see that my plural wives were supported and protected, the same as my first wife. 
The children of my plural wives are as dear to me as Margaret's and are equally as virtuous. Death or life, we polygamists will support and provide for our loved ones. They took us in good faith when there was no law in the land against plural marriage, and we will not fail them now. President Woolruff issued the manifesto in 1891, and from then on, polygamists could come and go without fear of arrest. Ah, uh, pioneer women, yours was not a smooth path, but how bravely you pursued it. When help was needed, the wives of Archibald volunteered to do men's work. Archibald passed away peacefully early in the morning of February the 8th, 1902. Just before he died, he said in a weak voice and with a smile, here I go to solve the great mystery. The command, honor thy father and mother, has been in the hearts of his children. His great pride was that they were all honest. Carry on, posterity. He gave you a name and heritage to be proud of. Never by thought, word, or deed bring dishonor to that name. Give thanks and clasp thy heritage. We need men to build a country. We need men with vision bright. So I appreciate all of the effort that went into the making of the Reader's Theater. Again, it's a good summary of Archibald's life, but there were many more things involved that we could talk about. One of the things that we determined to do here today was to get a brief summary of each of the wives of Archibald. We've tried to find a descendant of each of those wives to give that summary, and every one of them have promised to be five minutes or under. We're going to keep it as short as we can and still cover the highlights that we might be interested in. The first wife was Margaret Livingston. We have asked Delilah Williams, a great granddaughter of Margaret Livingston, to give the summary of her life. I feel honored today to give a little life of my great grandmother, Margaret Livingston Gardner. I never knew her during life, but I feel like I loved her, and I still love her. Margaret Livingston Gardner was born August, October the 12th, 1818, in Lock Hillhead, Argyllshire. Her parents were Neil Livingston and Janet McNair. The family immigrated to America in the first quarter of the 19th century in a sailing vessel and landed at Quebec November the 20th, 1820. 
Beside the parents, there were three little girls, Sarah, Mary, and Margaret. Margaret was two years old. The family made haste to a hotel, and there during the night, a fourth girl, Janet, was born. When the mother was strong enough, the family moved into a log cabin in the backwoods of Canada, where, a later, where later four boys, Neil, John, Duncan, and Dougal, were added to the family. The father had cut down trees, hewed logs, and built their first home with his own hands. He struggled for a few years <clears throat> tilling the soil, but it was a poor living he, he eked out. And thinking to improve their condition, he left to find work. He was never heard of again. With a breadwinner gone, life was hard. <clears throat> as soon as the girls were old enough to help, they went to Detroit, Michigan, to seek work. Sarah, the oldest, obtained a job as a dressmaker, and Mary as a serving maid. All the money was given to support the family. Even the visits home were made on foot. <clears throat> as soon as Margaret and Janet were old enough, Margaret worked as a lady's maid and Janet as a helper in the kitchen. In the year 1836, Archibald Gardner, a young Scotchman, built a grist mill in Broome, Canada. While cutting a road through the timber to a sawmill, he met Margaret, and it was the case of love at first sight. When he got <clears throat> his mill started, he sent to Detroit for her, a distance of 100 miles, and they were married February the 19th, 1839, in Brook Township, Canada. They made their first home near the mill. Life held promise. In the home, her oldest son, Robert, was born, February the 1st, 1840. A better home was built, and here her children, Neil, her, her son, Neil, was born, and here Archibald died, October the 10th, 1844. Age 18 months, died of bowel trouble. The gospel was brought to Canada by John Borman. The Gardner brothers with their wives, mother, and sister accepted it. Margaret and Janet were the only ones of the Livingston family ever to join the church. They left Canada in 1846. In June 1847, they began the long trek across the plains. Margaret drove a pan of mares all the way, even over Big Mountain. They arrived in the valley on October the 1st, 1847, camped in the old fort, and here, five days later, her daughter Margaret was born. Sixth, October the 6th, 1847. A wagon tongue which had been lifted off the running gears and made secure near the ground served as her hospital. In the spring of 1848, they moved to Mill Creek where the rest of their family, namely Sarah, Mary Ellen, Rachel Maria and Delilah were born. It was here she passed through the greatest trial of her faith. Her husband contemplated plural marriage, but she did not believe in it. In accordance with counsel, Archie wanted to marry another woman, but he would not without his wife's consent. She would not do this, 
and she was determined she wouldn't. I have gone through so much for the gospel, but this is the last straw. I will not give up my husband. For weeks, she kept her word. Then it was the practice of the present to travel to the different wards to the Sunday meetings. Her husband told Brigham Young about his wife's unwillingness to live polygamy. President Young went to their home and had a long talk with her. He told her he felt the same way about it when he, the commandment first was given. But because he believed so strongly and knew it was a commandment of the Lord, he was willing to abide by it. She finally gave her consent because she believed so firmly in the gospel. She was one of the many women who were called upon to do this, and she bore it in a wondrous manner. She would never allow her children to say anything against any of their father's wives and was very unselfish in her attitude toward them. You might say she was a perfect polygamous wife. So much did she believe in its being right after her conviction. She lived to see the gulls destroy the crickets that threatened their crops and acknowledge the hand of the Lord in sparing the crops. It was in 1883 that dread paralysis first touched her. Gradually, she became unable to walk, was deprived of her speech, and during the last years of her life was entirely helpless. Kind hands and loving hearts cared for her. She died in West Jordan, Utah, September the 21st, 1893, and is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery among her loved ones. She was a lovely, gentle soul, kindly generous, a faithful follower of the lowly Nazarene. It's up to be us to be true to the faith which her parents have cherished, true to the truth for which martyrs have perished, to God's command, soul, heart, and hand, Faithful and true, may we ever stand. The next wife was Abigail Sprague Bradford. I've asked Jim Daniels, a great-great-grandson, to give that summary. G Abigail Sprague Bradford Gardner was born August 4th, August 14th, 1813. She came of good English stock. Her forefathers... Uh, came across the ocean on the ship Abigail in, eight, in 16, 1628. Wo Brothers William, Ralph, and Richard were founders of the city of Charleston, Massachusetts in 1638. They were persons of character, substance, enterprise, excellent citizens, public benefactors, as were many of their descendants. Abigail's father, her mother, brother Ishtar, and wife, brother Henry, and Abigail's husband, Hale Bradford, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1838. They moved to Nauvoo, Hancock County, where Hale bought a farm and later purchased another one adjoining it. On one occasion, Hale and Abigail were taking their son Rosal to a doctor. 